I get to be here. I mean, I, I don't know how if you can get a hold of that, but I get to be here. I get to be here. I don't know anybody else that's fortunate enough or blessed enough to get to be here as I am. I mean, you just, there's, there's a story that goes with that, that no one else I know gets to live. The story that I get to live. If, if God hadn't raised up the Llewellyns to be our pastors, I probably wouldn't get to be here. I would be a lost sheep wandering around somewhere because this is the only pastor I've ever been in in my Christian life. And I get to still be here with my, all my family and my kids and my grandkids and my church family. I just get to be here. And I am the most unworthy person to, to be allowed that, that, for God to have that favor on me. I, I, have, I don't have an answer for it. I just know that I'm, I get to be here. I get to be here. Do you get to be here? Yes. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, open your Bible this morning to uh, Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to read for you um, from Luke 24 while you're getting to Acts chapter 1. That way uh, you don't have to shuffle around through your Bible as much. Praise the Lord. Well, in, in Luke 24, it says, And Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding. God, we just pray that you open not only our understanding in this room this morning, but Father, open the understanding, the eyes of people in this community. Lord, your word is true when it says uh, of, the, of the, the unsaved that God is not in all their thoughts. God, we pray for a great wake-up call in this community that you would invade the thinking of people in this community, invade their thoughts, Lord. Put your thoughts in there. Open their understanding about heaven and hell and life and death. Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name. So we open their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. You've got to be some understanding for these Scriptures. And then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ himself to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And then he says in verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, that means hang out, wait, in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. In other words, you're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations for repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus, but don't go yet. Wait until you get the power that you need to propel you for your task. And then in, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is, this is the same exact retelling of the story I just read to you at the end of the book of Luke. And this is Luke writing again. And they said in verse 7, is it, uh, or in verse 6, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel because they're living out of all these Old Testament prophecies in their mind? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which your Father has put in his own authority, but here's what time it is. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, even to Croatia. Chapter 2, verse 1. So they've been waiting for about 10 days, for they don't know what. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And because it's the Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits, and there's tens of thousands, perhaps, of people in Jerusalem who aren't normally there, they've come for this fest, festival and this holiday, and they said, what's wrong with these people? They're crazy, they're drunk, or they're whatever. And Peter says, no, that's not what's going on here. And he preaches the gospel to them. And in chapter 2, in verse 37, it says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We, we, we see the problem here. What shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, they were already believers. Now they, they believe. And he says, for the promise, that's the promise of the Holy Spirit, is for you and to your children, the next generation, and to all who are afar off, generation after generation, even as many as the Lord our God will call. For every generation... The promise of the Holy Spirit is for every generation. Amen? Amen? And so it says in verse 40, with many words they exhorted and testified. And verse 41, it says, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then what happened? They continued. When they got saved and filled, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the study of the word, and in fellowship, connecting with each other, and in breaking of bread, that's communion, and in prayers, they continued in these things. Amen? All right. Well, I'm, I'm bringing you a word this morning about our heritage. We have a heritage wall out there. That's kind of where this message came from, was looking at that wall. How many people have actually went and looked at the pictures? Okay, most of you. Go check it out. The guy on the far left in the black and white photo, the old gentleman with the gray hair and the mustache. Of course, it's a black and white picture, so everything's gray. But his name is Pike Robinson. And when he was 24 years old, the call of God was on his life to just do something for Jesus. And he started a Bible study in this community in somebody's house. I don't know what street it was on, but right here in this community, he started a Bible study in a home, and people began to get saved. And the next thing you know, they bought three little parcels of property, which is what that church, old church next door is sitting on, three parcels on the corner. And they built the first end of the church down there, which was like uh, 20 by 24 or something like that. And over the years, as God has moved on this property in this community, and people are saved and filled and called, things just kept going and kept going. So a few years back, I don't remember how long ago now, but we had our 50th anniversary of our church, celebrated the 50th anniversary of the founding of this church. And Pike Robinson, who has since gone home to be with Jesus was still alive, lived in Arkansas, I think, and we flew him out here, and we had a banquet, and of course, you know what everybody's going to want to know. Brother Pike, when you started this church back when you were 24 years old, did you ever envision that it would turn into this? He said, I didn't envision anything. I was 24 years old and had a call of God in my heart to do something, and I didn't, that's all I wanted was just to answer the call of God. Whatever that ends up being is what it ends up being. He said, uh, he said nowadays, I don't think the Assemblies of God let a 24-year-old man do any, kid do anything without serious oversight. But anyway, they turned him loose on this street corner, and I'm glad that somebody started something. Amen? So I've been around here for almost 50 years, and I've got a little bit of insight on the things on that wall and our spiritual heritage. So heritage defined from dictionaries is heritage is a person's unique inherited sense of family identity. 
Families have an identity. Do you know that? Most families have some kind of an identity. Now, when I was growing up in, in my hometown, there was a few families that had an, a family identity. And their identity started with the parents, uh, sometimes the grandparents. And they were rabble-rousers and hooligans, and their kids became rabble-rousers and hooligans and ended up in juvenile hall and jail when they got older, and their kids went off into the deep drugs, and it's just generation after generation after generation. If you grew up in one place for very long and you looked at your community, you know families like that. You could name their names, probably in this community. Hey, there's a, a heritage is a sense of family identity. And even if you don't have it, Somebody, somebody has given it. They know, what you're, they know what it is, even if you don't recognize it. Or it's the values, traditions, and culture handed down from previous generations. In this church, we have a culture that's been handed down from previous generations. Or it's something transmitted or acquired from a predecessor. It's a legacy. Now, I, I, I don't have it with me, but... I, I have a paper somewhere in one of my binders that is probably titled The New Life Legacy or Pastorhood Legacy. I'm not sure which one. But it has a list of the dozens and dozens of people that were saved in this church, either saved and or received their, their call and their, their training in this church and have made a difference in this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. On that list, it, I think it represents about 20 to 25 church, new, brand new church plants out of that. Some of the people on that list had two or three church plants. Mike Warren has had, had, had started at least four churches that I know of, and they're all flourishing today. Leland Paris has started a handful of churches here and in Mexico. This, this, it, there's a legacy. There's a legacy that we, we want to embrace. Amen? So we absorb a sense of our heritage throughout our lives as we observe and experience the things that make our family unique. We, every, every, every church is different. And uh, I got the revelation on that one day. Being a, being a construction guy, Brother Rich, I look at everything. I'm lining up that pole with that door jam over there, and I go and sit in a restaurant, and I'm looking at the window frames, and do they line up with the post outside the window? And you do that too probably, don't you? Right. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at stuff, and I'm seeing that we have a unique family here. So I'm walking into the mall one day and I look at the Kmart sign. There used to be a Kmart over here in our mall. And I happened to know at that time, just down the road on Lindhurst Avenue, there was a sign maker business. And Kmart hadn't been open very long and I remember walking into the store and I looked up at the sign and this thought popped into my head. Did the guy down the road build that sign or is that does all Kmart signs come from the same Sign maker. And I knew instantly before I even finished my thought process. Somewhere on this planet, there is a sign company that produces every single Kmart sign and every other uh, uh, chain store. Why? Because they want every one of them to look identical. It's their stamp. Okay? When God calls a man to build a church... He gives them a foundation, but you know, if you, if you get five contractors and five identical foundations, because Paul said, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, and then you build on that foundation. If you give five contractors identical sets of plans with identical slabs to build on, foundations, when they get done, there's going to be some differences. Because there are certain things that are not spelled out in the plans. Paint color. Curtain colors. 
Sometimes somebody's going to put a, a Dutch gable on the front. You know, there's a lot of leeway there. And so when you get done, that's why all churches look so different. But our church has a unique heritage that fits here. Now, Reverend George Wood was our, our uh, uh, general superintendent of the Assemblies of God for a few years. I believe he, is, he was born in China. His parents were Assembly of God missionaries in China, and he was born there. And he ended up being a missionary and a, a minister, and he became the superintendent of our movement. And the last time I heard him speak, the title of his sermon was Passing a Full Bucket. And the illustration that he gave was the fire brigade before there were pressurized fire hoses. How did they do it? You've all seen it in the cowboy movies. The building's on fire. They got the horse water trough was 50 yards over there. And they got a line of people filling buckets and passing, filling buckets and passing. And when it gets over to the guy who's actually throwing them in the fire, hopefully he doesn't get a half a bucket. Hopefully he got the full bucket got all the way there. And he hit, the point of his sermon was another generation. I'm, I'm 69 next month. That's like bumping 70. That's like too old to relate to the world that I live in almost. So y'all are going to have to get up and get busy. You know what I mean? Passing a full bucket. And he talked about the full bucket is the values of our heritage. And the heritage that I'm going to talk to you about this morning is on this street corner we are trying to pass a full bucket to the next generation. So a lot of times I heard my pastor, I, I was blessed enough to have the same pastor. Well, I still have the same pastor, even though he's in heaven. Though he's dead, he, yet he speaks in my heart, in my spirit. The things that he wrote on, that God used him to write on my spirit. And I heard him express his fourfold passion many times from the pulpit and in private. And his fourfold passion, if you will, pretty much became the expression of our heritage. And here's, here's what those four things are. One is to make a place for God. That's what our next service, our worship service, is not about you know, clapping along to some songs. It's about trying to make a place where God would actually want to come and visit us and become the true minister in that moment that will touch and change lives forever. In one second, everything about your life can change. And when you walk out the door, you find out nothing has changed, but everything has changed. Gary Whiteley's testimony is that you know, he got saved in prison, and, and I don't remember how many years he was in, but he was serving the Lord the whole time. And when he came out, as he was going out the gate, the chaplain, his mentor, was going in the other gate, going the, on the end gate, and he was going on the out gate. And his mentor, pastor, said, Hey, Brother Whiteley, just want to let you know that the only thing that's changed out there is you. Everything else is still the same, but you're different. One touch from God, and you're different. And to make a place for God in, in worship, and it's, you know, I, I don't have time to go through all those verses in Ephesians 2 about building a, a foundation, uh, building a house of worship for Him, a dwelling place for the habitation of God. The second thing of His, of his passion, of our heritage, is to have a growing church, to see people getting saved, not adding from other churches. I went into Dollar General the other night, or afternoon, and when I came out, there was a guy sitting in a car next to me, and I, I went to say something to him about Jesus, and he looked at me, and he goes, you're Al Moody, aren't you? I go, okay, well, at least he knows something. And I got in a conversation with this guy, and I couldn't hardly get a, a word in edgewise, because he spent a solid five minutes trying to recruit me to go to his church. I said, you know I'm uh, on pastor staff at New Life, right? Uh, yeah, but man, you ought to come over, man. We're, it's happening over here. Come on. I just, I just let it go. But 
I, I have never knowingly, I've been here in this one place for almost 50 years, I've never knowingly invited another Christian from an, a Christian from another church within driving distance of here to come to our church. There is no integrity in that. There's, there's no, somebody, all the wires are not connected somewhere for people that do that. I mean, if you drive down Hamilton Smartsville Road and you get out there where the cow pastures are and you see livestock in the field, when is it okay to pull your car over, hop the fence and go over there and put a halter on one of them things and start leading it somewhere else? If you think you have a legitimate business in that field, you go to the door and you knock on the door and you say to the owner, uh, do you mind if I go in your pasture and do blah, 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 blah? That's how that goes. So a growing church by getting people saved. And not just growing spiritually, but growing numerically. And, and our heritage is that because we, in 1980, January of 81, we moved into this center part of the sanctuary here. I think it seated about 310 people, including the pews that were up here for the choir loft. And then in a couple of years, no, it was 78, January 78 in here, January of 81, we opened this wing over here because people were getting saved. We needed more room. In February of 84, we knocked that wall down and opened that wing over there because people were getting saved. We needed more room. In 1981, the cry was deafening that we don't want our kids in public school. We need a Christian school here. So in 1981, we started New Life Christian School. In 1977, Pastor Hood started New Life Bible College. So that brings us to number three, to see men and women called and trained for ministry. And number four, to see a sovereign move of God that nobody could take credit for, that God would just start saving people. And Curtis May is walking down Alicia Avenue, spun out. And he, he had this thought, how am I even still going? How am I even still alive? And the Holy Spirit spun him around. He looked across that 10-acre field, saw this church, and the Lord said, you keep going in them doors. You just keep going in them doors. He came in here. God healed him, saved him, delivered him. And he's pastoring down the road right now. Notable miracles. A sovereign move of God. So these ideas and these experiences on these four points became the identity of our church for a whole generation. And because I was blessed enough to be a part of this experience and this heritage, I've lived out of that for 50 years. And I've tried to perpetuate it to the next generation. I perpetuated it to my three children who are in this church today, serving in this church today. One of them is my pastor, my daughter Jill. She's, I, I always get to hold her hand and say, I'm glad you're my pastor. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> my grandkids, all eight of my grandkids in this church, at the altars week after week, praying, believing God. And some of them are little bitty squirts. And they still make it to the altar. That's three generations in my family. And in, in Pastor Lou Allen's family history, their heritage goes, I think, probably four or five generations. So here it is. That's my introduction. All right. If you turn over to the back of that page, here's our, here's our heritage. The heritage of this church, the history the things that we have inherited from the previous generation that make the identity of this church. And maybe you don't even know, really have a clue, haven't been here long enough or uh, entered into this thing deep enough to get the grip. But I, want, I pray that God enlightens us today to what, what our heritage is. And number one is just get radically saved. Just get radically saved. Yeah, I'm saved. Have you told anybody lately? Pastor Lou says, if Jesus is in there, he's going to find a way to come out. Amen? Radically saved. John chapter 3, verses 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You have to be born again. You have to be born of water. That's your natural birth. And you've got to be born by the Spirit. Because if you're not born of the Spirit... 
you will not be able to see or enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. When you get born again, you get a new wisdom to live out of. I've watched people over the years have what I believe is a genuine born-again experience, but they reject the wisdom of God and continue to live out of their old wisdom, and they don't last very long. Because it just sucks them right back out into the world. A.W. Tozer, uh, a preacher from a previous generation, he called it getting thoroughly converted. Even back in his day, he understood that people could name the name of Jesus and not really be any different than they were before. He said, what we need is for people to get thoroughly converted. I read a story one time about the Romans uh, when, when Christianity was moving through the Roman Empire. And, you know, they, they were noted for having their, their army. And when the Roman soldiers got saved and they got baptized, when they went down in the water, they kept their right hand up so it didn't get wet only up to right here because that was their sword hand. God, you can have all of me, but not this one. This one's got to be ready for action. Hey, we don't hold anything back. If you're going to get radically saved, you're, you're not going to hold back. In Colossians 1.13... The Bible says we're delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his son. It's a, in a different kingdom, there's different rules that you live by. There's different wisdom that you live out, out of in, from one kingdom to the other kingdom. In John 2.15, 1 John 2.15, I'm going to read that one for you. I don't think I ever heard my pastor minister without this verse in his sermon. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He is writing to Christians, to believers, to not fall in love with the world and the things of the world. For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father. Those things are not of the Father. They're of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. When you get radically saved, you're going to do God's will, whatever that looks like, however he communicates it. In Job 31, verse 7, he says, If my step has turned from the way, I'm going, I'm going off the track, or my heart has walked after my eyes. Ooh, I think I like that over there. I'm going to go get that. Or if any spot adheres to my hands, I'm doing the stuff that God's not happy with. Ooh. What that means is the spirit of this age overtakes me. I'm caught up in the stuff of the world. He said, don't love the world. Don't love the things that are in the world. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he says to the, writes the letter to the, to the church at Ephesus, and he says, I've got a little something against you. I see you guys are doing pretty good, but you need a little bit of help here. You got, I've got something that you need to take care of. And he says, you have left your first love. We've got to get back to being radically saved and, and be living out of that first love. Keep the, the Jesus fire lit in my heart. My first three instructions as a new Christian were from Mark Anderson. The night that I accepted Christ, and he said, learn to pray, read your Bible, and go wherever Christians go. Learn to pray, cultivate my relationship with Jesus. To read my Bible. Start renewing my mind. I had 20 years of pollution in my mind. It takes a while to wash all that stuff out. You know, after the 97 flood, uh, Brother Dave Baker had this really, really cherry 70 or 71, 72 Chevy pickup. He had just, it was a short bed. It was a sweet ride. He just had it restored. I mean, fancy upholstery job in the seats. New, beautiful, dark uh, forest green paint job, metallic paint job. Uh, new engine in it. I mean, this thing was sweet. 
and it got flooded. When he, when he fled their home, he couldn't take that with him. And um, I, sa- I said, Dave, bring it to my house. Before the levee actually broke, when people were starting to evacuate, I said, bring that over to my house and just park it over here. He goes, no, it'll be all right. I said, if it's going to be all right, why are you leaving? Anyway, it got water up to the, almost to the top of the cab. And so I ended up getting that truck to my house. And I took the seat out of it and stood it up and started in with a pressure washer at the top and went down it. And when I got to the bottom, there's a big, big wave of brown water coming out, muddy water. And I did it again. And a big wave of brown, muddy water comes out of the bottom. And I did it again. And it was maybe slightly less brown. And I did, I did that, I don't know how many dozens of times I did that. And every time there was still a little residue of that flood, mud, that came out of it. That's how the Word of God is going to change my thinking. Your spirit is saved instantly. Your mind is going to take you the rest of your life to get straightened out. And it happens by the Word of God. Paul said to the Romans, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You put different, put God's thoughts in there. Read the Bible. And then he said, go wherever Christians go. The church is my new family. Now, my older sister is flying out here from Kansas City. She was supposed to get here at 5 o'clock tonight. I just got a text before church. They can't, their, their plane schedules are mixed up and they can't make their Denver connection, so they're coming tomorrow. But for the first time in I don't know how many years, maybe 2007, maybe, there's my younger sister, much younger. (laughs) I have to say that so she won't disown me. (laughs) Anyway, it'll be the first time that myself and my brother and two sisters will all be together since probably 2007, I'm thinking. So it's my, when my families, they all get here, I'm going to be spending time with them because they're my family. But, you know, generally we're all scattered out. My brother lives in Nevada. My, sister, my older sister lives in Kansas City. And uh, Carol just moved here. She lived in Oregon. So we're all scattered out. But, you know, when it comes to the spirit, this is my family. I spend time with my family. Where my family goes is where I go. Amen? We live a transformed life. Okay, getting radically saved. Lee Limperis walking across the Eastern Michigan University campus, and a voice said, if you go around the corner over there, there's some guys that are going to tell you what you need to hear. And he went over there, and it was open-air preachers preaching the gospel. Gary Whiteley said he, he, he had his first opportunity to get out of his cell when he went back to prison was to go to chapel service because they'd lock you down for a while until they process you and all that stuff. And so his first opportunity to get out of his cell, they said, anybody want to go to chapel? And so his thought was, I'll go to chapel. I'll see my homies, maybe score some drugs or whatever. He went to chapel. He walked in the door, and the church group that was there was warming up their worship team, and they were playing Amazing Grace. And he said the Spirit of the Lord touched him. He just fell to his knees and wept, and he's never been the same since. He got out of prison, had nowhere to live. Nobody wanted the guy. His history was so bad. He lived in the river bottoms in a tent with a hole in it, had a sleeping bag, a lantern, and a fishing pole, and a Bible. And never missed a church service for two or three months coming here. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Enrolled in Bible college. Eventually got out of the river bottoms, got a job, got a place to live. Got married, had kids. Hey, God's good, amen? That's what being radically saved will do for you. You you appreciate what you've got. The second point is of our heritage to get powerfully filled. In Acts 1.8, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. That word, power, in the Greek uh, manuscript, that word is dunamis. The same word that you translate into English as dynamite. Somebody, we got to light the fuse on our dynamite, folks. If we got the dunamis in us, if we got the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we got to start lighting that fuse, get that thing burning up. 
Get powerfully filled. In John 7, 37 to 39, I think Pastor probably hit on this last week maybe. Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, out of his belly, his innermost being, is going to flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given because he was not yet glorified. Well, I got news for you. Jesus has been glorified and the Holy Spirit has been given. Amen? So I'm going to read to you Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel's having a a vision, and he's carried away by an angel, a spirit. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there the water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. You have a threshold, right? Where is it? Right here. That's the threshold. That's where things go out and come in, is your threshold. Water's flowing from the threshold. Verse 2, he brought me out by way of the north gate, and he led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faced east. And there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out in the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. The farther it goes, the deeper it's getting, folks. Again, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I couldn't cross. The water was too deep, and it was so deep that one had to swim in it. Are you guys getting this? And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned, and there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region. It goes down into the valley and enters into the sea. And when it reached the sea, the waters were healed. He's talking about the Dead Sea, where there's no life. It's totally dead. But he said, when this water came out of the threshold of the temple, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost in this generation. If you're born again, you're the temple. We are the temple. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you've got a threshold. And this river of living water needs to flow out over your threshold. And it says, when it reached the dead places, it came to life. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. Everything lives where the river runs. We sing it here. Do we believe it? If we could start light the fire on that fuse of our dynamite that he's given us, pray in the Spirit, speak in tongues. That's the river of living water. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When that power starts touching your life, everything is different. And everything lives where the river runs. And the longer you learn to speak in tongues and pray in the Spirit, the deeper things get the deeper the water of the Spirit gets in your life. Amen? Come on, amen? Amen. All right. We're talking about our spiritual heritage here, about getting powerfully filled with the Holy Spirit, getting radically saved and powerfully filled. One of the last times that Dr. C.M. Ward uh, spoke publicly, I was privileged to hear him. Uh, He was so frail, they put a desk on the platform and a chair there for him, and he sat down, and he didn't really preach like he did when he was young, but he talked. And he, t- I, I still remember, this was probably back in 19, early 80s. The authority is in the Word. The power is in the Spirit. And Jesus is the attraction. That was his three-point sermon. And when he talked about the power was in the Spirit, he said when he was uh, 11 years old, that his sister got hit by a car. And they took her to the hospital, and the whole family ends up at the hospital, and the doctors came out with a grim report. This is, this is not going to be good. It's not probably going to make it. And back then, the hospitals were different than they are now. They didn't have security guards and all that stuff, so the whole family's in there. And they've got a sheet on a, a curtain around the bed, and he said, my daddy went in there, And being a Holy Ghost-filled man, 
he went in there and he started speaking in tongues. He started praying in the Holy Ghost. He said after he prayed in the Holy Ghost for a couple of minutes and it was still going, he said, I, I pulled that curtain back and I looked in there and I said to my 11-year-old soul, she ain't going to die today. And she didn't. God raised her up. Because there's power in the Spirit. The power of God. The power of the Holy Ghost. It's for you. And if you don't tap into it and make it a part of your life, you are living so far below what God has for you. What's left if you don't embrace that? To love the world. To chase the things of the world because you're not chasing the things of God. So what, and we're all going to chase something. We're all living for something. Okay? All right. Last point. I don't usually bring my phone to the pulpit, but I got something I want to read you in a minute. You get radically saved, get powerfully filled, and get sold out for the harvest. Whatever that means to you, wherever you fit into that picture. Very few of you are ever going to do what I'm doing right now. That's just, that's a fact of life. But everybody has a place in the harvest. If you're a member of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, I believe it is, said that God sets each member in the body just as it pleased him. So he's got a place for you to fit in the body. One plants, one waters, Paul said. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. What is that calling? Well, I can't answer it for you. I just know what it is for me. I know that when God, on April 4th, 1975, walked into the latrine in the barracks at Beale Air Force Base, and the devil was in there, and God slapped him on the side of the head, and I fell out of his shirt pocket, and he said, I'll take that. Worthless, no good, nothing. I, I, next month, I'm supposed to go to my 50th high school reunion. I've never been back to any of them in Oregon, but I'm going to go to this one. And I don't even know why, because I cannot think of a single thing that I ever did when I lived in that town that me or anybody who knew me would be proud of. And God said, I'll take him. I'll take him. And in one second, my life changed. I was completely different. The world didn't change, but I'd, something changed in me. And I didn't know what being in the ministry was. I didn't know what apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I didn't know that there were Bible colleges. I didn't know anything. But I knew that he's, he's, he plucked me out of the darkness and had purpose. And so how did I get from there to here? Well, for 50 years, I pretty much just get up every morning and do what Jesus wants me to do. It's not that hard. Just get up in the morning and do what Jesus wants you to do. He wants you to be salt and light. In Ephesians 4.11, talks about those ministry calling gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, it talks about spiritual gifts and manifestations. In Romans 12, 3 through 8, it talks about service and, and ministry gifting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everybody has a place in the body of Christ to function in the harvest. Jesus said the harvest is ripe. The laborers are few. Why are the laborers few? Because we don't rise up and take our place that he placed us in the, in the harvest. We've got too many other things to do. We're too busy uh, looking at the world and looking at the future and looking at the news and all that stuff. In Ephesians 6, verse 16, Paul talks about putting on the whole armor of God. And in verse 16, he says, Having your feet shod, your shoes on, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means getting up every morning and putting your gospel shoes on, tying your shoelaces and saying, let me at them, folks. Where are they? Where are they? I was out in front of my house the other day, and I walked down the sidewalk, and I was walking back, and this young lady was walking the other way, and, and she looked at the house next door that, that they're doing a lot of work on, and she goes, I always kind of like that house. She, I'm a total stranger. She don't know me. She goes, I've always kind of liked that house. When I go by here, I, I keep thinking, there's some potential there. 
I said, well, they're, they're working at it. And she started walking on by me. And I said, hey, I said, did he find you? She goes, who? I said, Jesus. Did he find you? And her face lit up. And she goes, yes, he did. I don't know where she goes to church, but she, there, there was a Jesus response in her. I was pulling out of the bank, and there was a guy walking across the street. I rolled my window down. I said, hey, I know somebody's looking for you. He goes, is it a woman? I said, no, it's Jesus. <laughs> hey, he's looking. He's looking for people. It's up to us to put our gospel shoes on, lace them up, and go out among them and be salt and light. Philippians, Paul said, we shine as lights in, a, in amongst a crooked and perverse generation. We're to go out there and be salt and light wherever we can. And I'll tell you how I got to right here. In 1981, six years after I was saved, I, I was working in construction, had been for a few years, and the Lord began to poke me in my spirit that it was time to pursue my calling, whatever, whatever that was. Ministry. I knew I was, I was called to some kind of vocational ministry. And it just so happened that one day I'm driving through the church parking lot and just to see who's here and what's going on. Pastor Hood and a couple of guys were standing out in the driveway talking and when I pulled up there, Pastor walked over to my door, my window, and he said, uh, he said, Brother Al, he said, um, on June 1st, there's going to be an opening for a staff pastor at, at our church. Why don't you pray about that and see if that's what God wants you to do? And this was like in, in March or April. And anyway, it, 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 that set right with my spirit. Felt like that's the will of God for me. But you know how the enemy works? At the moment, I was working for a guy over in Yuba City. We're building custom homes on uh, north on Stabler Lane, Sharon Drive, Valley View, uh, Pam Drive, I can't remember all the, Nadine Drive, and all those streets up there. And so him and his wife bought some property in Lincoln, California, which was really an up-and-coming thing, and they were opening a subdivision there. So I'm working for the guy by the hour. I'm most of the time his only employee. He occasionally would have other guys. So him and his wife take me to Mr. Steak. That's how long ago it was. Anybody remember Mr. Steak? Okay. So they take me to Mr. Steak for lunch, and they say, we want, we want you to do something for us, and we want to do something for you. So they told me about this subdivision they were opening uh, in Lincoln. And they said, we want to we take you off hourly and put you on a salary. We want to give you a truck and a, and a, a gas card. And we, we want you to run that job down there, oversee that. And what we're going to do, if you'll do that for us, we want to, we'll, we want to, you can have your choice. We'll give you a percentage off of every house that sells. Or we'll just sign over two building lots to you for your own, to get started in your own building trade, your own business. And all the time I'm listening to them, I'm going... <laughs> In your dreams. Because it's not in my dream. Not in my dream. And I had to wait like another month before I went to them and I said, you know, I'm going to have to give you my one house notice that when we're done with this house right here, uh, i got to follow the call of God in my life. And they're like, what? These are both people who have been raised in church. I don't know that they were going to church at the time. But they, they, they understood what I was talking about. I said, I just, I can't do this. That doesn't fit the peace of God and the will of God. I'm, I just try to get up every day and do what Jesus wants me to do. And he didn't want me to do that. And so 
I got, I got one little uh, nice check mark by my name on that house because when we finished that house, it, it won the Yuba Sutter Developers, Builders and Developers Home Show first place. And I got to do all the finish work inside that, brother, by myself. My boss was hardly ever around. I got to do, hung the cabinets and the doors and built the little redwood railings that went to the downstairs living rooms and all that stuff. But that's not, that wasn't my calling. That wasn't what God had for me when I got up in the morning. That's not where he said go. He said go right here. When I was on pastoral staff with Pastor Hood for 20-something years, I had other pastoral offers. A friend of mine from my hometown called me and said, our pastor is leaving. Will you come up here and feel it out and see if you think that's what God wants you to do, is come and be our pastor? And I said, I didn't pray about it. I said, nope. I, I know that's not what God wants me to do. He's got me right where he wants me. There was a, a church within driving distance of here who was asking me to come there and be their pastor. And I said, I couldn't do that. I could never do that. There's absolutely no integrity in that. I couldn't, knowing the connections that I've had here for 20 plus years at that time, I couldn't go pastor a church, you know, within driving distance of here because a significant number of people here, for whatever reason, feel attached to me more than they do to this church. And they would go there. And I couldn't do that to my pastor. I couldn't do it to this church and whoever the next pastor would be. I got invited to Tyler, Texas to be the pastor down there. They Obviously, these people don't know me like you guys know me. But anyway, Jackson, California, of all places. And then in 1989, this is digressing a bit, 1989, I went to South Africa uh, to travel with a missionary, Bill Younger, for uh, two and a half weeks. And we went to a little mountain country called Lesotho, which is down in the, the lower tip of, of the continent of southern Africa. And while we were there, one of the local pastors, he, he, got, a, he got a hold of me, literally, by my clothes. And he said, I challenge you to come to Lesotho. And I, I, got, as, I got as animated as him. I said, if Jesus challenges me, I'll be here. But he didn't challenge me. And I just try to get up every day and try to do what Jesus wants me to do. So we're going to close this out this morning with a couple of quotes from a fellow named C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was an up-and-coming cricket player in England who literally would be, I mean, head and shoulders beyond whatever you would call the number one draft pick in the NFL or the number one draft pick for the NBA, any of that stuff. He had a very, very lucrative and promising future in sports, in cricket, which is bigger than the NFL over here probably. And he said, that doesn't fit the call of God in my life. And you know where Todd Churchill, where his missionary, his mission field is the DR Congo, right? In the heart of Africa. That's where C.T. Studd went there and broke ground. He says, let us not glide through this world and then slip quietly into heaven without having blown the trumpet loud and long for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let us see to it that the devil will hold a thanksgiving service in hell when he gets the news of our departure from the field of battle. Some wish to live within the sound of a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue mission within a yard of the gate of hell. God's real people have always been called fanatics. Brother Reddick, the evangelist, he used to say, a fanatic is someone 
basically, who is intensely interested in something you don't care anything about. That's what a fanatic is. That's what we look at people as fanatics because they're wild about something we don't care about. God's real people have always been called fanatics. True religion, this is the last one, I could go on, there's a lot of them. True religion is like the smallpox. If you get it, you get it, give it to others, and it spreads. I'm telling you, there, there's not enough time in the day to tell you the stories that go with all the pictures on that heritage wall out there. My question is, what is the next segment of that wall going to look like? Will there be any of your pictures on that wall who said, yes, I will get up and answer the call of God. I'll find my place in the body of Christ. I'll get up every morning and do what Jesus wants me to do. I'm not going to love the world and the things that are in the world. I'm going to chase after the call of God. I'm going to unleash the river of living water in my spirit. And that everywhere the river runs, life is going to happen. Will you be on the next segment? There's going to be a next segment of that wall, folks. And I don't know what it's going to look like. My picture's on there, and my wife, and our little segment. And I'm looking pretty old. And I'm looking for somebody to pass a full bucket to. And in this next service, I can't believe how overtime I am, I'm sorry. In this next service, God wants to dump a full bucket on you. Amen? Glory to God. Lord, Father, I, I poured it out the best I could that you poured it in me. Lord, I pray that you somehow capture our hearts and our spirits, light the fire of our heritage once again, to be radically saved and powerfully filled and sold out to your harvest field. Grant that, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.